Hello, my beautiful babies, and welcome to Chapter House Dune Club, session four. For this session, you need to read pages 305 through 396 in this copy of the book. And if you're not reading in this copy of the book, the last sentence, sentences of the last chapter of this session is great dur protect me will i be like that before we get into our chapters let's dive in with a little recap confrontations are abound in session four we shine a light on dama and logno's relationship as the spider queen takes odrade's bait and orders her aid to bring her the witches from Bazel. With Odrade and Tam out of town, Belanda takes the opportunity to confront her little Duncan problem on the no-ship only to find herself being handled instead. The Mother Superior makes it to the Desert Watch Center and attempts to ferret out Shiana's secrets before making her a member of the High Council. Mirbella faces her fears in a waking nightmare. Soon she will undertake the spice agony, yet still she refuses to give up her Duncan. And he too refuses to give up on her. And Sightail loses yet another bargaining chip in his uh, bargaining with the witches. That was well written right there, Danica. When Shiana enters with a brand new baby sandworm in tow. Uh, in the final confrontation, Mirbella confronts Odrade, refusing to work on Sightail, and most importantly, she will not give up her Duncan. All right. Thank you, Just Bluefish, for subscribing. Appreciate it. All right. So here we go. Chapter 26 Goldur be blessed. The Spider Queen is living her best life in the heart of her web on Junction. She has transformed the interior of this old guild building into something that partially resembles her old home on Durr. She is happy. She's feeling blessed to have found the perfect place to rebuild the honored Matre's strength after, the, after their harrowing flight into the old empire. Dama has heard through her spies that the which stationed at Bazel has returned and is delighted, thinking Dortulia has come back to Bazel because she had been refused sanctuary by the Supreme Witch. The time has come, and she commands Logno to bring that old witch and all of her attendants to her and begin starving those futars. The great honored Matre reflects on her aide Logno being a constant threat but that's why she keeps her around. Lagna keeps Dama on her toes, keeps her alert. Everything is proceeding as planned. The witches will soon be wiped out. And once they find Chapter House and destroy the Sisterhood's central body, it'll be no big deal taking care of the rest. Ix, however, is still giving her trouble. She's worried that Maybe she shouldn't have killed those two Ixian scientists yesterday, but they dared to demand more information after having no success in finding a solution for rearming the weapon, even though they don't know that it's a weapon. Or did they? Hmm. Maybe it was good that she killed them. Teach them a lesson. Bring us answers, not more questions, you Ixians. <laughs> Again, it's like the, it's so insane that they're like, we're not going to tell them what this is or what it does, but we're going to need these scientists to figure out how to fix this problem we have. And it's like, you, that's so, you can't, that's not how it works, babe. But anyways, Dama is not a fan of all of the diversity that she is finding in the old empire. There's too many different cultures, too many religions, and she is excited to bring order to her new home. Simplify things with one religion, the worship of Guldur. She wants the uh, tyranny of the minority cloaked 
in the mask of the majority. <laughs> I feel like when I read that, I, I like instantly thought like Twitter. <laughs> like when I heard the tyranny of the minority cloaked in the mask of the majority, I was like, oh my God, it just like, it was so funny. I, I got a laugh out of it. Um, and she also, we learn more about why she killed Lucilla. Um, and that was what the witch Lucilla had recognized. No way to let her live after discovering she knew how to manipulate the masses. The witch's nests would have to be found and burned. Lucilla's perceptiveness clearly was not an isolated example. Her actions betrayed the workings of a school. They taught this thing. These fools. You have to manage reality or things go out of control. You can't tell people about these secrets. Oh, my God. These witches. Logna returns telling Dama that the old witch and her attendants from Bazel are being brought to her and that the Futars are being starved. The aid encroaches two millimeters inside the Great Honored Matre's danger zone. And Dama turns with orange eyes blazing. <laughs> Logno almost kneels and blames her eagerness to serve. And the Spider Queen thinks, yeah, right. It's your eagerness to replace me. Don't you get too close. I know you're trying to kill me. You got to stay out of the little zone. Dama asks Rebecca about, or da Dama asks about Rebecca, and Logno tells her Rebecca has temporarily eluded them before scurrying away. Success. That was the danger, and it cost them an empire. If you waved your success around like a banner, someone always wanted to cut you down. Envy. We will hold our success more cautiously this time. I really liked that Dama's thinking, you know, after Logno leaves and she's just like, hmm, how did we fuck up? Yes, we were too successful. <laughs> we were too successful. It's just people were jealous and that's why they had to get rid of us. But we're going to we're going to learn from our mistakes. We're going to learn from our mistakes. <sighs> then she looks out onto her beautiful garden and silently rolls the names of all the captive planets she has on her tongue. Chapter 27, he's a better mentat than I am. This is a really fun chapter. I very much enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it as well. It starts off with this wonderful header. Humans are born with a susceptibility to that most persistent and debilitating disease of intellect, self-deception. The best of all worlds and the worst get their dramatic coloring from it. As nearly as we can determine, there is no natural immunity. Constant alertness is required. Okay. It's a self-deception. I mean, it can be a boon or a bane of your existence. You know, some people use it in ways that kind of like the fake it till you make it. You can use self-deception in a way that you can kind of like deceive yourself until you're actually doing it. But then at the same time, there are people who they fake it and then they never make it. And then it's like everything comes crumbling down. You know, there's like there's a lot of stuff that you got to be careful with the old self-deception, the old denial. Um, so when Mother Superior is away, the Belanda comes out to play as soon as Adre leaves Belle. As soon as Audrey leaves, Belle heads directly for the no ship to take care of this damn dangerous Duncan Idaho. Dar has even once admitted to Belle that her affection for the Gola influences her decisions. And she is like, hell no, this Gola's gotta go. She finds him alone at his console and he says to her, hello, Belle, I've been expecting you. He presses a button, and young Teg enters the room and stands there, staring at her. Belle goes, and she has to schlep a chair from Idaho's sleeping chambers and seats herself opposite this rival mentat. He explains that he knew she was coming when Odrade called and told him that she was off to see Shiana. I knew you'd waste no time getting to me when she was gone. Bell enters Mintat mode for this confrontation. Idaho says that she's known that she's wanted to kill him for a long time. And she's like, am I that 
transparent? It's like, yes, Belle, you are. He knows her plan was to come start some shit with him and then bait him into a fight to create the illusion and an excuse for self-defense so that she could murder him while also keeping her hands clean. Rather than have Marbella here to protect him, he's chosen Teg because A, he doesn't want to put Marbella in harm's way, even though she could probably destroy Belle. She doesn't, you know, he's like, that's my pregnant baby. That's my pregnant wife. Like, she don't need to be here. And B, if Teg witnessed Belle kill Duncan, then he's not going to serve the Bene Gesserit. And besides that, who's going to restore his memories if Duncan is killed? This would throw a major wrench in their plans to survive the Otter Matres. Teg is curious as to why Belle has come to kill Duncan, uh, the man who would restore his memories. And Idaho explains to Belle that they need each other. Uh, he knows that there is anarchy within the sisterhood and disagreement within the highest councils. Belle tries to deny it, but Duncan calls her out. You're a hypocrite, Belle. And this barb hits deep, hits her real deep, <laughs> enough to produce an involuntary movement on her part and deep enough to terrify her of this opponent. And it hits her so deeply because it is true. Belle is going on and on about how the sisterhood isn't in chaos. Uh, but then she's literally come here against Odrade's wishes to kill this Mentat. So it's like, bro, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, like, oh, oh, the sisterhoods. Oh, we're fine. Everything's good. And then it's like, you're getting ready to betray the mother superior? Like, you are a hypocrite, lady. And I find it marvelous that a Mentat and a Reverend Mother could be such a hypocrite. Tag asks if they are fighting. Duncan says, yes, we're fighting. <laughs> and Belle is like, what the fuck is happening right now? My plan has gone totally sideways. Duncan continues with his offense, asking the old woman questions like, why do your sisters tolerate you? Are you a necessary evil? Are you a source of valuable data and occasional good advice? Could it be that you strengthen your sisters? Weak links create, place, create places others must reinforce, and that would strengthen those others. You came with criminal disobedience in mind, a little drama for the calm eyes proving you had no other choice. As bummed as she is at his insults, he finds that all this is restoring her mentat abilities. Idaho continues telling her that he is deep into the Bene Gesserit's problem and that they need his imagination, his inventiveness, the things that kept him alive in the face of Leto's wrath. Because remember, <laughs> he worked with the tyrant for thousands of years. <laughs> Without something new, you are doomed. He scoffs at their recent scattering, saying that they are only seeding the universe with enemies and feeding honored matres. The two discuss the Bene Gesserits previously, the Bene Gesserits that were previously scattered and why they never returned until Bell starts asking the right questions. And now that he's got her on the right track, he ends their discussion by calling her by the most ancient Bene Gesserit the most ancient term for Bene Gesserit council members, Mater Felicissima, <laughs> which translates to most happy mother. Using this term produces a balancing effect on Belle, and she is in awe of his powers to correct her and wonders how he knew how to do all of this. Of course, the tyrant trained him thus time and time again. What do we have here? What is this talent Mother Superior dares employ? Dangerous, yes, but far more valuable than I suspected. By the gods of our own creation, is he the tool to free us? Oh, she's beginning to see the light. He asks Belle to go into her other memory and visit one of her ancestors, Antiac. Uh, and he had met her in one of his past lives when the tyrant sent him to Wallach Nine on a mission to suppress an outlawed 
Mentat school. And if you remember, Antioch was in God Emperor. She was the older uh, secret Mentat Bene Gesserit sister that met with Leto during the festival at On. And she ended up working for him because he liked her and, and she helped him out on some stuff. And she ended up dying while leading the fish speaker invasion of Ix to capture good old Uncle Malky. He asks again, where have your sisters gone, Belle? She is unsure and looks to his console and changes her position. It was wrong to block him from all of their data. She's like, damn. Oh, I've been wrong this whole time. This man needs the data. We got to we got to give it to him. He challenges her to broaden her mind. Think um think that honored matres could be a relatively small group compared to what's potentially out there in the scattering. There could be fucking no planets for all we know and people who could see through no shields. There could be wild Atreides talents that they haven't even guessed at out there in the scattering. And why didn't the tyrants suppress Ix? Could there be cyborgs out there? What about Shiana's immunity to sexual bonding? What about that? What about the Futars who supposedly hunt and kill honored Matres? Mirbella's never heard of them. What's going on with that? Belle finally sees Idaho's value. Priceless. And I might have killed him. The nearness of that error filled her with dismay. Everything she had learned about Idaho today increased his danger, but they had to live with it. For now. <laughs> For now. She leaves and Idaho turns to Teg. And he is like, thank you, little homie. You bought me enough time to save myself from Belanda because she thinks that I am Quizette's Hatterack, which I'm not. He knows that he isn't truly safe, though. He's just bought himself more time. Um, and finally, he may get a little bit more access to data, full access to the data. He thinks, I am not the only one in a special school. The sisters are in my school now. I've got you, ladies. <laughs> Tag asks if he can leave and find Rebella. Because she's going to teach him how to fight with his feet, <laughs> which I thought was so cute. He's like, oh, you know, the Bashar never learned to fight with his feet. I'm going to learn. He sends the boy off for training and tells him not to talk to Marbella about what's just gone on with with uh, Belanda. He'll tell her later. And he thinks about how schooling in a Bene Gesserit environment never stops and wonders if I'm learning all this. What is Sightail learning over there? He goes to Marbella's quarters, and I love that he sees a little, like, the claritone used to echo vo vocal experiments and a breathing harness to force prana bindu responses. And it was like, oh, cool. I didn't know they had little tools like that, the claritone and the breathing harness. That's neat. I'd love to know more. Marbella returns from training and heads to the showers but duncan stops her dead in her tracks and he asks and he's um but duncan stops her dead in her tracks when he says that he's discovered some things about the sisterhood that they didn't know before and she reverts to her old honored matre self you better tell me what are you talking about a game where one of the pieces can't be moved they not only expect me to help them create a new religion around shiana our willing participation in their dream, I'm supposed to be their gadfly, their conscience, making them question their own excuses for extraordinary behavior. Much like Miles Tag was uh, tasked with that to make a human decision for the Bene Gesserits in our last book. He tells her Belle has been there and recounts their showdown. Right on time, Rebella exclaims that she will never cooperate with the sisterhood if they harm him. And he's like, ha ha, I knew you were going to say that. Thank you. They get in the shower. And she thinks to herself, I remember no moment when I awakened and said, I love him. No, it had wormed its way into this deeper and deeper addiction until accomplished fact. 
It must be accepted in every living moment, like breathing or heartbeats. A flaw? The sisterhood was wrong. Things get real spicy with them in the shower. Uh, only afterward could she remember and say to herself, he knows every technique I do, but it was more than technique. He wants to please me. Dear gods of Durr, how was I ever this fortunate? And that is, that's, I'm glad that she appreciates that. It's great when you find a lover who really goes out of their way to please you. So good for her. <laughs> he carries her out of the shower, dripping wet, and lays her on the bed. They are, after their exertions, they're kind of taking a breather. And Duncan talks to the calm eyes, warning Belle that she's got more than one tiger by the tail with Shiana. Good luck controlling that one. Back at Central, Belle returns to archives and checks in on the watch mother who's been watching Duncan and Rebella. And she tells her in the shower again. <laughs> it gets boring after a while. <laughs> it cracks me up so hard. It's like, it's in the shower again. It gets, it gets boring. Belanda goes to her quarters and realizes that Duncan is a better mentat than she is. And that she is jealous of Shiana because she is immune to the sexual bonding. And there's a part of everyone in the sisterhood, including Belle, that wants to try that hot shit. It looks like it's a lot of fun. Next chapter, 28. What is Shiana hiding? And this one starts with one of my favorite quotes. There's so many good ones. There's so many, many, many good ones, but this one is one that I think about a lot. Give me the judgment of balanced minds in preference to laws every time. Codes and manuals create patterned behavior. All patterned behavior tends to go unquestioned, gathering destructive momentum. Whew, I like that one a lot. Down in El Dio, Tam brings morning news to Odraid that the shifting sands have made the glaze way impassable beyond the sea. Fun fact, I love that it's called a glaze way because when they make their roads, they like put down whatever it is. It's like the road stuff, but then they like hit it with like a burner that's like so hot that it just glazes this material and just fuses it together. And that's how they make a road. And that sounds really neat. Love that idea. Mother Superior shifts plans and commands that they travel to the observation terminal by ground car and have the Thopters meet them there. Oh, and tell Claire B that you are riding with me today, Tam. On their way down to the terminal, they pass the bare foundations of uprooted communities that the sands will cover completely soon. Things are really changing out there in the landscape. An acolyte asks if, it tru if it's true that they are already making spice harvesting equipment. Odraid confirms and asks Tam if she's ever walked on the open desert of Dune. The older woman hasn't, but assures Dar that her other memory tells her everything she needs to know about it. It's not the same, Tam. You have to do it yourself. A very curious sensation on Dune, knowing a worm could come at any instant and consume you. Tam retorts, I've heard about your Dune exploit. <laughs> Walking on that sort of Desert changes you, Tam. Other memory becomes clearer. It's one thing to tap experiences of a Fremen ancestor. It's quite different walking there as a Fremen yourself, if only for a few hours. Tam says that I did not enjoy it. <laughs> like, I don't want to do it. Drop it. I have no interest in going out on the sands, Dar. So much for Tam's venturesome spirit, and everyone in the car had seen her in a bad light. Word would spread, but now the shift to Shiana on the council... So now, the shift to Shiana on the council would have an easier explanation. They arrive at the observation terminal, the edge of the desert, where the sands are creeping in a silent war against the greenery. And while they wait for the thopters, Odraid goes over a request from Weather and approves it, thinking yesterday... Did I decide to phase out the sea only yesterday? What a big decision. Jeez. 
I decided to phase out the C. It's a lot. She is caught in a vortex of thoughts, the idea of continuity of people and their artifacts. She felt tool sense as a living part of herself. I'm better because of this stick in my hand, because of this fire sharpened spear to kill my meat, because of this shelter against the cold, because of my stone cellar to store our winter food, because of this swift sailing vessel, this giant ocean liner, this ship of metal and ceramics that carries me into space. The communications acolyte interrupts her reverie. Belanda says to tell you immediately that there has been a messenger from Bazel. Strangers came and took all of the Reverend Mothers away. The strangers are described as being commanded by a woman. The messenger said that she had the look of an honored matre, but was not wearing one of their robes. The messenger is a first stage acolyte. She came in the small no ship following explicit orders from Dortulia. And Dar's like, yay, it's happening. They've taken the bait. Tell Belle that acolyte must not be allowed to leave. Dar calls Belle. Determine if that messenger acolyte is ready for the agony. Belle's like, she is. Then see to it. Perhaps she can be our messenger. Already have. Is she very resourceful? Very. Oh, and I want Duncan to have an open link with archives. Did that this morning. And it's like, she's like, holy shit. Like, who is this lady? What has happened to Belonda? This contact with Duncan is certainly having an effect. Belonda tells Audrey to tell Tam that she was right. Very well, Belle. I couldn't be more satisfied with the way that you are handling matters. After the way you've handled me, how could I fail? Smiling, Belle hangs up. So cute. Oh, Belle is finally on board. I love that Belle is finally on board. Bitchy Belle. She's she's ready to be a part of the team. We love it. We love to see it. Makes me happy. Tam tells Odrade uh, that Belle's talking about Tam being right, about there being more between Idaho and Shiana and that they must discover her secrets before they put Shiana in Tam's chair. Dar is shocked that Tamalay knew that she was planning to replace her with Shiana. Tam's like, girl, I know you, I see you, come on. When the proctors voted, um, Tam tells uh, Audrey that when the proctors voted, whether they're voting to keep her or get rid of her, it was your creativity that worked for you. Inspired is the way one of your defenders put it. Odrey tells her, then you know that I'll have Shiana on the coals quite thoroughly before I make one of my inspired decisions. Uh, and there's a nice little thing about creativity in here. Creativity, always dangerous to entrenched power, always coming up with something creative or always coming up with something new. New things could destroy the grip of authority. Even the Bene Gesserit approached creativity with misgivings. Maintaining an even keel inspired some to shunt boat rockers aside. That was an element behind Dortulia's posting. The trouble was that creative ones tended to welcome backwaters. They called it privacy. It's like, oh, this is a very wise very wise thing about creativity it kind of reminds me of when we were watching one flew over the cuckoo's nest yesterday and how the authority did not like all of the new creative things that mac was was bringing to the people there they were not about it um the thopters arrive and the sisters take to the skies in the silence odrade thinks on how they must think of marbella as a sister not that their captive honored Matre was an incurable failure, but that she was a misfit and undergoing the deep training at a very late age. Mother Superior takes a nap until they arrive at their destination, the Desert Watch Center. She goes uh, to her guest quarters on the ninth floor below Shiana's penthouse at the top. Adraid prepares herself for this encounter, opening her mind, shedding her preconceptions shiana returns from the desert and asks for the mother superior to meet her in her upper quarters dar goes upstairs and checks out shiana's place before her students arrival there is a drawing of a sandworm in black and white with a 
tiny robed human figure in the foreground on the end wall. Struck by Shiana's deep impression of nature uh, that is exhibited in her rendering, she guesses at what else this drawing says about the artist who made it. Odrade hears Shiana at the doorway, peering around the door before entering the Mother Superior's presence. Odrade thinks to herself, you often thought of her as quiet little Shiana. She was not always quiet, nor was she small, but the label stuck. She was not even mousy, but frequently like a rodent waiting at the edge of a field for the farmer to leave. Then the mouse would come darting out to glean fallen grains. And I, I, I was like, I really related to that quote. I was like, yes. I feel like too a rodent waiting at the edge of the field for the farmer to leave so I can get my little grains. I totally I, I, um, resonated with that. Shiana speaks first. We've been apart too long, Mother Superior. Odrade senses candor and concealment. Shiana knows that this is a confrontation and that her only defense is the truth. Mother Superior gets the impression that her student wants to give her, her old student wants to give her a hug. She remembers Tam's warning about Shiana. She is, the, she is one of those who keeps herself to herself. Remember Sister Shuang Yu? Like that one, but better at it. Shiana knows where she is going. We'll have to watch her carefully. Atreides' blood, you know. Odrade speaks. Indeed, this visit is long overdue, Shiana. And the girl responds with the old BG Placid. Bene Gesserit Placid. It is a face that is just so fucking calm that it acts as a mask to cover anything that's going on beneath the surface. This was not just a barrier. It was a nothing. The woman instantly realizes her mistake, breaks the mask. Oh, I was like, that made you look really suspicious, Shiana. What are you doing? Why are you hitting her with the BG Placid? You can't do that. She laughs and gambles it all on the truth. It's about the hand talk with Duncan, right? Is that why you're here? Is this what we're doing? Odrade wants the details. Shiana explains that Duncan wants a woman on the inside to rescue them if Honored Matre's attack and information about the Bene Gesserit's intentions and details on what they are doing to meet the Honored Matre threat. I've told them everything that I could. I am his friend at court. Unlike Tam and Belle, Dar knows that she's still hiding something. She admonishes her student for misjudging Belle and asks her if she thinks that she can work with the Mentat mother. Sean is confused. Work with Belle how? On that stupid missionary project? She asks, is this because I tease her? Tease, is that what you do, Shiana? An appropriate word, reshaped by going against the natural inclination. Shiana thinks to herself, oh goodness, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, I'm giving myself too much away here. <laughs> I'm, doing a, I'm doing a lot of reshaping against natural inclinations in myself. Like, oh Lord. Odrade is alerted by these words and looks over at the black mound of plaz in the corner. It drank vision. She kept probing for coherence, something that spoke to her. Nothing responded, and that's its purpose. Shiana notices Drade's attention on the sculpture and tells her it's called Void. What do you think? The Mother Superior is internally bummed, hoping Shiana did not sculpt it because the one who did this has gone where I cannot follow. And Odrade is so alarmed by this sculpture because unlike the Van Gogh, which earlier there was a header about art needing to be anchored in life, and we need somewhere for our plugs to connect. And like void is not anchored in life. It is rooted in nothingness. And what is this wild nothingness welling up in the artist who made it? Void is displaying powerful hidden emotions, feelings of disconnection from life, deep seated discontent. <sighs> not looking good. The mother superior cuts to the chase. I have a problem with you, Shiana. You alarm some sisters around me. 
Shiana is alarm as alarming her sisters because a she's the youngest ever to survive the agony, which was a wild stunt on her part. She was advised not to do it, did it anyways, and b because of her elaborate, detailed accounts of her seductions at dinner. That was spicing more than the food. <laughs> I, like, I like that. Spicing more than the food for the other acolytes. Particularly, it was heard, uh, she, it, she was heard saying, I used the let him misbehave method. Very effective with men who think they're leading you down the garden path. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, she ought to. She really is a little seductress. And C... They can all sense this wildness in her that they have not found. There's something going on in there. Uh, bes and besides talking to worms, what other shit is lurking in her Atreides genetics? Shiana is relieved when they are interrupted by an acolyte and takes her leave to check out some scans. Odraid remains in Shiana's quarters to wait, and while she is looking around, she notices a hot young stud sunbathing nude on a rooftop. How can he be so idle? Is he a night worker? Shiana runs back in. Odraid, they found a spice mess 30 clicks northeast of us. Small but compact, and I have set a round-the-clock watch on it. Odraid once again cuts to the chase. I asked you earlier, Shiana, if you would work with Bell. It was an important question. Tam is getting very old and must be replaced soon. There must be a vote, of course, though. So before it's, you know, you, know, you can't just have it. And uh, Shiana is like, me? <laughs> me? Oh, Jade's like, my first choice. You are my first choice. And partially it's because she just wants to be able to keep an eye on her old student. But what about the missionary's plan? What about my work here in the desert? Well, I can see that you're shocked. Um, I get it. I need to know, Shiana, what really interests you these days. <sighs> Again, Shiana, I gotta tell the truth, says, making sure the de desert grows well. And my sex life, of course. You saw that young man on the roof, Trebo. He's a new one Duncan sent me for polishing odrade accepts this answer and leaves uh, and shiana is glad that she did not have to fall back on deeper truths that she's uh, been discussing the possibility of imprinting tag to restore his memory so it's like a, we're okay so if she keeps going i'll give her this but she didn't have to do that but if she had really kept going <laughs> the full confession would have been that she's found a way to reactivate the no ship and diffuse the mines. <sighs> she kind of does got some secrets. Yeah, limited knowledge. You can you can work at the desert on the weekends. Totally. Oh, all right. Uh, chapter twenty nine. Witches do mysterious things. <sighs> I know the fact that Shiana has like three shells of half truth backups. <laughs> totally, Stevan. Absolutely. I mean, they're truths. It's just not the whole truth. I wouldn't say it's a half truth. Well, I guess it's a half truth. I mean, it's the truth, but there are more truths that she's she got away with it this time. There's just so many confrontations in this session. I really, it's really interesting. I really like it. Mirbella is having a nightmare. And this nightmare is so bad that it doesn't even stop when she wakes up. She's uh, surrounded by enormous predatory words that have teeth and claws. She's hoping that the sleeping Duncan beside her will wake her up. But no, his arm thrown across her legs only holds her tight within her sleep paralysis. Marbella begins to laugh uncontrollably waking her lover who activates the glow globe and asking what her deal is. And the scene reminded me a lot of Eyes Wide Shut when Alice is having that nightmare and then Bill wakes her up. But like, in her, in her, but it's like kind of different because like in the nightmare, she's like laughing. And then when she wakes up, she starts like crying. And, but it's like, it's very, it's very, I don't know. This is a lot of, this is a lot of Eyes Wide Shutty. She can't stop laughing. 
And Duncan becomes concerned. And finally, she catches her breath and tells him about her nightmare and Belanda's earlier lesson on linguistic heritage after learning that she could speak nine languages. <laughs> Limited knowledge. Attacked by Comic Sans. I know. I wonder what the fonts were that were coming at her. Duncan tells her that uh, what Belanda did to her was Zensuni, a very ancient technique. The sisters use it to rid you of trauma connections, words that ignite unconscious responses. Marbella tells him that she was warned by Honor and Matre teachers that terrible things would happen if they ever fell into Zensuni hands. Duncan brushes it off. I went through the same thing in Mentat training. It's like, it's, it's not a big deal, dude. They discuss the sisterhood's use of words as weapons or tools of control and how she must learn this lesson before the sisters will trust her with deeper training. Only secretly, Duncan does not look forward to this because after she learns these tools of control, he feels like he will never be able to trust her again. Mm, poor Duncan. Rebella keeps prodding at Duncan, arguing about patterns and discipline until she gets him, until he gives up trying to go back to sleep. And he, I like that he punches his pillow. He's like, okay, we're here. We're doing it. We're not going back to sleep. What do you want? What's eating at you? They go back and forth about the Bashar's abilities. Marbella thinks that he's just another tool of violence, damning the Bene Gesserit uh, to be just as self-important as the honored Matres. Duncan defends uh, the Bashar and the Bene Gesserit. He reminds his lover of Miles Tagg's, Miles Tagg's reputation for winning battles uh, without blood. And he teaches her that the self-important are aligned with a death reality. So honored matres are people who support no one but themselves. Whereas the Bene Gesserit are aligned with a life reality. They support the web of all human life. Um, she asks Duncan then if he is a willing participant in the Bene Gesserit's dream, and he reluctantly admits that he is, surprising even himself. Their lover's spat intensifies, and Marbella calls the Bene Gesserit out for their lies, their cheating, and their viciousness. Especially how Belle is delighted that Duncan is set to cause uh, the Gola Miles the same pain that the Bashar Miles inflicted upon him. Idaho tries to quell his lover by offering to disappoint Belle in this matter. But he's like, oh, no, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, goodness. And Marbella is thrilled by this idea. Yes, we must disappoint her. Duncan manages to divert the conversation and they talk about the rumors swirling around Tag that he could move faster than the eye could see uh, before his death on Rackus. Duncan dismisses these rumors as something that the Bashar um, started himself to throw people off. Marbella is not so sure. His lover questions him as to why he thinks Belle is such a hypocrite, but doesn't think Odraid is just as bad. She trusts your loyalty to the Atreides. Duncan thinks to himself about Odraid, a terrifying woman if you let yourself dwell on her abilities. Atreides, for all that. I've known Atreides and Atreides. This one is Bene Gesserit first. Tags the Atreides ideal. He tells her, I am loyal to Atreides' honor. Okay, not to them, but to, to the Atreides' honor. Marbella bends close and whispers in his ear that she feels like she could kill any Bene Gesserit within her reach. And he is like, whoa, 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 you, whoa, they can hear you. What are you doing right now? Like, what has set you off? Like, what is this? Finally, Marbella spills the beans. Odraid wants me to work on Sightail. And she says it was your idea. And by work on, she means use her honored matre skills to enslave him so that they can get what they need out of this fucker because he is just a pain in the ass. Um, and it's funny. It's like, this is just like, this is so real too. Like, this is such a great example of an argument, especially, I mean, not necessarily between lovers, but especially between lovers where 
there's, you know, it just takes so long to get at the heart of the matter. Like, has this ever happened to you where somebody's arguing with you about stuff and then you just keep digging and you keep going and you finally get to like what they're actually upset about. And it just takes so long to get there. And you're just like, oh, you know, like it just, it takes a minute. You got to warm them up. Duncan, I mean, I'm sure I've, I've done the, I've done the opposite as well. I've been the one who's, who's, uh, you know, been, been hiding and beating around the bush too. I mean, we've all done it, but it's such a real thing. Duncan finds himself disgusted by the idea of Rubella sleeping with Sightail. And he denies that he ever suggested this particular course of action. All he suggested was that they needed to pry information out of him. And he asks her, well, how do you feel about working on Sightail? I mean, it's like, he, you know, he knows her previous background. I mean, he's, she's slept with countless men and enslaved them. Like, it's, it's not like this is, she's done this many, many times before. But she says that she is revolted. I love you and my body is to give you pleasure, Duncan. And he sees this look of love in her eyes. The same look that the Lady Jessica gave to her Duke this blind, unswerving love that the witches distrust so much. <clears throat> the two talk about the Bene Gesserit dream, and Duncan explains to her that it is, uh, in, in more colloquial terms, it's grow up humans. Stop. Start acting like adults and not like angry children in the schoolyard. And he honestly believes that, you know, mommy does know best like the Bene Gesserit know what they're doing and they're right is that how you really see them even when you call them witches it's a good word Marbella witches do mysterious things he admits that the witches do trick people into doing things that they want and Marbella is disturbed by the Bene Gesserit levels of manipulation, creating poses and spouting words to get their desired response, trapping people. She sees, oh, hold on, good Get out of here. She sees too much honored matre in the Bene Gesserit and asks Duncan if he knows how the honored matres trapped her. There was a sweep. She was about three or four years old, she was outside playing with her friends when there were explosions. When the explosions were done, she peeked out. She saw that her entire house had been destroyed. She does not know if her parents were killed or if they survived. Her mother, though, was a great beauty and her father was a big, handsome man. And maybe she can't remember for sure, but maybe he refused to succumb to an honored matre. And she thinks that maybe this whole thing was just to snatch her. Duncan asks, why do you think that the sweep was because of you? They do that sort of thing. And Duncan reflects like, oh, the, the watch mothers are going to love it. She just said they. She's referring to the honored matres as others, something separate from herself. She's not aligning herself with them anymore. He asks, so you hate them? She explains to Duncan that she resents nothing that has happened to her because everything that's gone on in her life, has led her to him. Aw, what a sweet baby. Honored Matres may have manipulated her without her consent, using her as an enticer to recruit valuable males. And if the sisterhood wants to use her, they are going to have to pay her price. And that is Duncan stays. Not fucking side tail. And... She's going to need the truth about why they really need her. He tells her to be careful. They just might tell you. She turns on him and asks how he plans to restore Tag's memories without pay. He can see in her eyes that she's already guessed it and has already plotted with Shiana and that she is not happy about this situation. Trying to save himself from her ire, he admits that he disagrees with many of the Bene Gesserit's actions, but he does not distrust their motives. And Marbella states that she will know their motives 
if she lives through the agony. And he's like, oh, quit bringing it up. He's like so bummed. He starts thinking, oh no, my Marbella, she might die. Life without Marbella would be a yawning emptiness deeper than anything he'd ever imagined. He reaches out to caress her back. I love you too much, Marbella. That's my agony. He starts going on an emotional binge until he remembers a mentat teacher's words. The difference between sentiment and sentimentality is easy to see. When you avoid killing someone's pet on the glazeway, that's sentiment. If you swerve to avoid the pet and that causes you to kill pedestrians, this is sentimentality. Like, oh. So, he, like, I love that he stops himself. Like, he starts spiraling, thinking about Marbella dying. And then he catches himself. And he's like, okay, whew. you know, it's okay to be, you know, sentiment's okay. But, like, let's not spiral here in sentimentality and, and go into a, a, a spiral of bullshit that's just going to lead me into some nonsense. He tells her, words plus body more than either. And his words plunge her back into her nightmare. But this time, she goes with a vengeance. She faces her fears and relishes that she has achieved the willingness to laugh at herself. Something no honored matre has ever done. She feels freedom and awe at the possibility of becoming a reverend mother. And as somebody who has... Um, had some sleep paralysis issues <laughs> like i've had not a ton of it but i've had sleep paralysis and one of the ways that i have burst the sleep paralysis bubble is through laughter and just realizing how like i just realized in this moment how scared i was and like how funny it was like how scared i was because it was just like what a ride like this is so absurd like how scared i am right now and like this is a fucking dream and then like it just like i just started cracking up and like laughing at how ridiculous it was and then like it just like boop, like it's like a soap bubble that burst you know the it just i was fine and sleep paralysis was gone so i i will say laughing is one great way to deal with sleep paralysis if you're being confronted by a creepy, creepy sleep paralysis demon, <laughs> like, just start laughing at it. Or another thing that's worked for me is I got really pissed once. Once I just got really mad. I was just like, you motherfucker. Like, I just was so mad. I was so mad that he had made me scared. And I was just, I was like, you fucking asshole. Like, and then that also burst it. So, um, <laughs> PJ says, also try kissing your hot sleep paralysis demon. Be careful. Be careful with that because they're going to keep coming back. I don't know about that advice. You're going you're gonna to lure a succubus in there. They're going to they're gonna keep coming back, fool. Uh, um, but yeah, so. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. We'll talk about sleep paralysis in the Q&A. You can tell me some of your sleep paralysis stories. On to chapter 30. Something squirmed in the pod. It's taken two months of deliberation to get Shiana confirmed as Tam's successor. With Tam's open support, Belle delivers the news to Audrey that it's done. We finally confirmed Shiana. It's good to go. Also lets her know that Marbella is due in eight days or so the Sooks claim. Bell does not trust souk doctors, which I, I get it. I don't, I don't trust them either. I don't trust doctors either. So it's like, I mean, there are good doctors out there, but they're very few. There's a lot of bad ones, you know. And uh, also, there is still no word from Dortulia. Once Marbella recovers, and like when she gives birth and recovers, it is agony time, and it's getting close. Bell wonders if they've discovered all of Shiana's secrets. And could it be that she's just had qualms about imprinting a gola of the mother superior's father? Not likely. I don't believe that. Uh, is Shiana another flawed reverend mother? Possibly. The two women debate the merits of imprinting this child rather than using the pain method. Odrade likes the sexual imprinting method because 
the pain method might be too painful and could alienate him from them. And he might hate them for it because it's just like, it's almost as bad as the agony. It's, it's not cute. It's not fun. Bell likes the idea of using the imprinting method because then they'll be able to influence him. They got an imprinter who imprinted and then he'll be, you know, kind of favorable to the sisterhood after that, further putting him under their control. <sighs> Odrade then goes to the no ship and takes Sightail out on one of their routine walks. But this time, she is taking him up to her workroom to bargain in more pleasant surroundings. She asks him why he insists on having his own face dancers before acceding to their requests. And what's this new interest in Idaho? Dear lady, I have no companions in my loneliness. And he rubs at his chest. And the little capsules in there. Odrade is really sus about all this rubbing. She's like, what? What is in there? There's no scars, but like, I don't trust these fools. And like, this, god damn it, this weird little guy. He's so annoying. She starts working on him on their walk. She's trying to get him off balance before she sits him down for bargaining time. And one of the things she uses is by working on him through his great belief telling him that he was betrayed by his own people from the scattering, which is true, who left him with no more Malik brothers, only sisters. So it's like, you don't have anybody else. We're the only people you have. And she also repeats the sunset cry of the Mahai at the setting sun, you know, saying the sun is not God. And, you know, his, wa his, his faith is starting to waver a little bit. He's just like, I know, I know, I know these ladies are false. I know they're pulling to scum, but then, you know, they just keep, they keep talking to me in my language. They enter her workroom uh, just as the, the light, the sunset dips below the horizon and uh, leaving them in a darkened room. And Odrade, again, another way to just throw him off balance. She knows he hates darkness. Just she's she has him sitting there in a dark room with her. Uh, she puts him in a little chair dog or big chair dog. It's actually too big for me. Looks like a little kid sitting in it. And then, you know, once she's got him freaked out a little bit, she turns on the globe globes and on cue, Tam is in there. She swishes to life and she stands two paces behind the little man, sending ominous vibrations his way. So now we're intimidating him. We got Tam over him <laughs> intimidating him. Odrade questions him on his escape, leaving his brothers behind to die. Uh, again, throwing him more off balance, being like, you know what? You escaped and you left all your brothers to die. That's cute. Why were you leaving Bandalong when the attackers came? Thinking of Bandalong makes him sick with grief. And he accuses Odrade of taking some of his cells and growing a goal of replacement. She does not deny it. You think the sisters would let the last master end here, do you? He warns her that no gola of him will do anything that he would not do. Don't even try it. She says she understands and reminds him of the Bene Gesserit powers of truth sense. So it's like, you're. we know if you're lying right now, so we're going to keep talking. She continues to prod him. And he admits that he was commanding a force of Khazadars and that they were searching for a herd of Futars for their defense and that their scattered ones uh, had brought them Futars originally, but they would not produce in their tanks. And then the specimen died. There was only like two of them. Um, further, you know, she's having him essentially admit that they were fooled by their own people from the scattering. So just really driving that betrayal home, uh, making him, you know, really see it with his own words. Just then, Belanda projects in with urgent news from Shiana. Spice blow. We got sandworms, baby. The hologram bell turns to Sightail and says, uh, you have lost another bargaining chip. We have our spice at last. Ha ha, loser. She leaves. Um, and... Sightail thinks that this is a trick. You guys are just trying to trick me. I'm not going to fall for it until Shiana enters 
towing a small suspenser pod in her wake. And inside there is a baby worm stretched out on a bed of golden sand. That's right. They did it. They got sandworms. We got baby sandworms. It's so exciting. The prophet. He thinks to himself, oh, the prophet is right there. And I, he's like, I don't know, maybe this baby sandworm is like two and a half feet long. It's still got those little teeny, those little teeny teeth though in there and the little fires you can see in the little mouth. Shiana says, thousands of them. They came to a spice blow as they always do. Sightail looks the most defeated that Odrade has ever seen him look. <laughs> this poor guy, he's like, no, no, I'm a prisoner and now I have nothing. I, almost nothing, not nothing, nothing, but really that's the real thing. Like they, the Bene Gesserit wanted to know how to make spice with the tanks and now they don't need his fucking tanks to make spice. God damn it. Shiana opens the pod and holds the little worm like an infant. And it's obvious that she still controls them. <sighs> Sigh of relief. Shiana's still got control over the worms. Odrade asks the little Lelaxu master, do you still serve the prophet Sightail? Because there he is. Right there. Right there. While you were on your selfish, foolish little mission, we were serving the prophet. We rescued the last revenant and brought him here. And this planet will become another dune. Oh, he's sweating it. He asks for more time to think about what, Sightail? How there can be, how can there be anything for you to reconsider? This is our prophet. You say you serve the great belief, then serve it. Sightail knows the sisterhood no longer needs him, but he still needs them. Odraid explains it's a whole new universe out there that the Bene Gesserit are scattering pods of rage against the honored Matres. People are longing for the old days of Reverend Mothers. And what? Think of what would happen if we loosed that rage in a jihad. If you were to escape, where, were your, where would you go? Your own scattered ones don't want you. We are partners here by necessity, if not by shared belief. Times are changing. He offers to exchange knowledge of how to make the finest tanks, but insists on his own face dancer attendance and his own axolotl tanks. Odraid says she will consider it and gives him time to think. She dismisses him back to the no ship. Belle comes in and she goes over the interaction as a mentat along with Odraid and Tam and Shiana, and they discuss seeking allies from the scattering Bell comes to the prime projection that the handlers who created the futars want to control the Bene Gesserit. Uh, there it was. They faced it with all of its perils. It came down to people, as it always did. Odraid, Tam, Bell, and Shiana are working beautifully together. And Dara thinks that if they can just get Marbella as a sister and get a restored Bashar, they might have a fighting chance at survival. But then her good feelings are interrupted when she receives word that Claire B, her driver, has just been in a thopter crash and is mortally wounded unless they add a bunch of mechanical parts. Fuck. Do we cyborg him? Like, where do we draw the line? First, we're dealing axolotl tanks. Now we're going to be cyborging people like, but we're already spread so thin and like necessity. We can't lose another guy. And, but necessity, I mean, it's like the, then, you know, you start doing this now. And then like, are we going to make more fucking cyborgs? Like, ah, uh. Audre really agonizes over this decision. But in the end, she tells the doctors, cyborg him. Do it. <laughs> I love cyborg him. I like that it's used as a verb. Cyborg. It's cyborg somebody. <sighs> yeah. Esteban says, I love Belanda's grunt when Odrade assents to it. Yeah, and she can't tell whether Bella's like for it or against it. She just grunts. She's just like, uh, <laughs> you know, like, mm. And chapter 31. There are things I won't do. Odrade is at the no ship and finds a super pregnant Marbella. 
still in those leotards. Man, they always got her in those leotards. You know, she's always in those leotards. He loves leotards. Frank Herbert is all about it. Unitards, leotards, he just want. he loves it. She is training with a mech and Odrade is impressed by the beauty of Marbella's vitality, of the health that's just glowing through this woman. And it's not just because she's pregnant. It's like that, like that was one of the first things Lucilla recognized is just like the the health just just glowing through this woman's skin. And uh, and she's also, even though she's super pregnant, she's still so graceful fighting this mech. And she notices that Marbella has fucked with the circuits of the mech to stimu- to simulate anger in it ultra dangerous and on top of that Marbella greets the reverend mother uh in the middle of training even crazier it's like girl you this reminds me of the alia scene when alia was like fighting the little sword mech thing <laughs> and then like she's like going too hard and then still gar sees her and she's like crazy and naked and wet from a bath and the Stilgar's like we gotta get her laid <laughs> that totally reminds me of that scene uh, and Audrey turns the mech off and asks why she changed the circuitry. The two women go into a philosophical banter, and Audrey is delighted when she hears Marbella speak about her excitement at being challenged to do more than she ever thought possible. Mother Superior thinks to herself, Mens sana in corpore sano. We have her at last, which means a healthy mind. And a healthy body. She got a healthy body, but now we got her thinking. We got her thinking real good. She disguises her elation and continues to question the girl. Is she willing to pay the price? She warns her of her ignorance about what it means to be a reverend mother and that she doesn't really know what they want from her. Marbella asks if Odrade will use Shiana to imprint upon young Miles. And if that's the case, why don't they just enslave him like honored matres? Odraid sees the wildness in Marbella. She's twisted in a way that's difficult to uncover. The Reverend Mother admits her fears at Marbella's capabilities and at the love that she shares with Duncan. How Reverend Mothers are taught never to abandon the self. Marbella accuses her of trying to make her choose between the sisterhood or her Duncan and announces that there are things that she will not do. She asks if Odrade will continue to train her in spite of her refusal to give her Gola up. Odrade leaves the choice up in the air for Marbella to decide, um, but secretly, Odrade feels that the Bene Gesserit must change their ways, and this woman could be the one to guide them into that change. Marbella brings up the Lady Jessica, whom Duncan had her study extensively, and they bandy back and forth about the consequences of the Lady Jessica's love for her Duke. This love created the Kwisatz Haderach and the Tyrant, but Marbella says it also created the Golden Path and Survival for Humankind. Odrade says, and then the Famine Times and the Scattering. And then Marbella says, and then Honored Matres. All of this, all of this because of Jessica's love. And... Odrade says, yes, yes, all of this because of Jessica. But in the end, she returned to the Bene Gesserit as a teacher of acolytes and as served as an example of what happens when you defy us. And again, she's thinking to herself, defy us, Mirbella, please. But just do it more skillfully than Jessica did. Mirbella admits that sometimes you repel me, but you know that I want what you have all your cool skills. You got so many cool skills. Odrade changes the subject and asks if Marbella still refuses to work on Sightail. Let Shiana do it. Well, will you coach her then? And okay, if I do, will Shiana use my coaching on the child? Marbella relents and returns to asking about her Duncan. The Reverend Mother only asks that she consider the possibility uh, that her attachment to him is a difficulty, but that it is her difficulty. And how would she feel if someone could show her how 
to set herself free from the sexual addiction that her and Duncan share. Marbella is surprised and says that she almost said that that would set her free. Marbella admits that she does not renounce her honored matre ways, but has grown beyond her former sisters, like sisters of childhood, playmates in a game that no longer interests her. The Bene Gesserit is all to a reverend mother. You will never be able to forget that. Prepare for advanced training until you meet the agony, live or die. So Drake is like, okay, just letting you know, you know, <laughs> Bene Gesserit's all to reverend mother. So, you know, do what you want. Uh, and she also, uh, the rather, <laughs> the mother superior also is like, send Shiana in here to meet her new teacher. All right, we got to bring her in. Can't give this lady any time to reconsider what she's doing. We're going to start the training right now. Marbella is surprised that Odrade really does intend to work on the goal a child of her father. Odrade tells her, think of him as Bashar Teg. That helps. Marbella thinks to herself, the Bene Gesserit is all to a reverend mother. And like, it's like, oh, this is crazy. You know, like, like this woman, this reverend mother is willing, A, to create a gola of her own dad and then have an imprinter imprint upon him while he's still a child to awaken his memories and that's her dad, you know, but, but they're doing this because they've got to preserve themselves so that they can continue to try to preserve mankind. You know, like that's, she's just like, this is a lot. And it, it hits her that like the Bene Gesserit really is all to a Reverend Mother, that someone would be able to do this. And um, she thinks to herself, great Durr, protect me. Will I be like that? <sighs> all right, that's it for session four. So much confrontation. So much confrontation. For session five, oh shit. for session five, you need to read pages 597 through, no, 397 through 503 in this book. And uh, the last sentences of the last chapter of this session, session five, is they've already sent us a message, Tam putting us in a second-class hostelry, and I have responded. Whew. All right. Where did they go? What are they doing? We'll find out next session. All right, kids. That's it for today. Thank you for watching. Um, we'll be back next week with session five, uh, and now we're going to go to some Q&A here with our people live on Twitch and for all of you out there on YouTube. Love you and we'll see you next week. Mwah.